Good evening, everyone. It is really a great joy to see all of you here with us today, and for all of you watching from home via live stream, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are here tonight with Christian Clark. As I had mentioned to you, he's a wonderful young lawyer. I think many of you saw the video uh, that I did, and we were just reminiscing now. It was actually thanks to the, the Myers that we were having dinner one night in Ridgewood, and you guys were at the other table behind us, and we reconnected, and um, that's what kind of led us here to tonight. But I want to give you a little bit of background on Christian. Actually, his wife, Catherine, is right over there. They have uh, three little ones. Uh, Caroline is in the stroller, and the little boys. Oh, there she goes, right on cue, right on cue. Um, but he lives in Ridgewood, grew up in Ridgewood, and we just found out uh, with Father Jay there in the back that they just missed each other in high school. He was just a few years ahead of Father Jay, but they knew some people in common. So, um, grew up in Ridgewood, as I said, went to Ridgewood public schools, and then the, actually the only blemish on his academic record, which is very impressive, is that he went to Don Bosco. So that's the only thing that happened. You know, we feel very badly for him. He didn't get into Bergen Catholic, so you know, he had to go to Don Bosco. But then he made up for it, and he made up and he went to BC, Boston College. So he finally got there. I'm gonna get here. Um, and then after being in Boston College for a while, obviously doing very well academically, uh, felt a call to perhaps going into the um, Society of Jesus, into the Jesuits, and he did a year in the novitiate with them, a year of kind of discernment and everything, uh, discovered that it was not his vocation, uh, and then decided to come back to New Jersey, and he actually taught at Don Bosco, Mr. O'Connor right over there. So he taught there for how many years were you there? two years there, and then he decided to go to law school, uh, went up to Boston to Harvard Law School, finished that, and then obviously came back here and he's working in the city. So that's a little bit his curriculum vitae, uh, very impressive, and this talk as I shared with you, I so thoroughly enjoyed it. We had it with the, the moms group, and then we had it with our seniors group. So I don't know if any of their seniors are you, so you're coming back for it. You come back for a second time. Okay, so they, they liked it that much to come back for it. And um, for all of you watching, he's going to be speaking for about four hours. And then, um, then we'll be taking questions. No, it'll be about 40 minutes. And then we'll give opportunity for any questions. Um, does anyone have any questions, concerns? We're good. Everyone's happy in their places. Good. Christian, thank you so much for Thanks, coming. So much, okay. Thank you. It's all yours. Thank you. Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay on the mic? Okay. Um, Thanks for having me back at St. E's. I talked to the moms and the seniors uh, late last year. So bless your heart. Anyone, I see a few of you now I'm saying twice. Uh, you know, really uh, bless your heart for coming out again to hear this talk. Uh, so, um, this talk is uh, looking at the historical evidence for the resurrection from the perspective of the law. Our legal system is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it does reflect centuries, arguably even millennia, of wisdom about how we decide whether something is true, whether something is probable. And we never approach scientific certainty, but we make all kinds of really, really important decisions take away people's liberties, we take away people's money, give it to other people or institutions based on a set of principles that we use in the law about how we decide whether something's true or not. So, okay. Okay, okay, sure. So I won't pull this. Yeah. Is that better? Yes, yeah, sorry everyone. What happens is when he speaks from here, it echoes a little too much, so we brought him up here. So if you want to start again, we could do that, and hopefully we'll have less of an echo, I hope. Okay. Um, so, uh, basically, in short, um, the idea of this talk is taking the lens that we all accept to varying degrees in our courthouses all across the country about how we decide to uh, grant decisions in legal cases and applying it to the historical evidence uh, of the resurrection. 
from the Gospels, from extra biblical sources, sources outside of Scripture. So that's kind of the, the big picture uh, lens of this talk. But before we get there, uh, what I like to do is give a, a five minute crash course in law school. So I call it law school in, in five minutes. And uh, this is the first time I'm doing it with a PowerPoint. So forgive me if I'm a little bit um, awkward as I toggle back and forth. But uh, law school in five minutes. Okay, there, there are three principles I want to talk about. And anyone who's been to law school, I know Mr. O'Connor's been to law school, others, uh, recovering lawyers maybe. Uh, these are three things that you would touch in law school to varying degrees. Um, and I'm going to talk about each one of them very quickly. So um, there are two kinds of legal cases, broadly speaking. And I'll make this a little interactive. Does, what, what are the two types of legal cases? There's civil cases and there are criminal cases, right? OK, so everyone's familiar with that. Probably everyone knows that what the standard of proof is in criminal cases. Does anyone want to shout it out? You have to prove your case beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So that's a standard of proof. So that's a kind of criteria, is really the layman's term. That's the criteria for winning, right? In civil cases, the criteria for winning or the standard of proof, it's different. It's actually different. It's, it's lower. Does anyone know what it is in civil cases? Preponderance of the evidence, so 51%. It really, it can just be a little bit more evidence than not, more likely than not, and you win. And although it's beyond a reasonable doubt when we take someone's liberty away, because we view that as so important, we make really important decisions in the civil context, depriving people of all kinds of property, making important decisions based on a preponderance standard. So that's 51%, more likely than not. And, and that's the lens I'm going to approach tonight. I'm going to look at the evidence for the resurrection as if it were a civil litigation, a civil case. And our standard of proof is a preponderance, OK? Stages of litigation. And sorry, I skipped over. So what's your standard? Lawyers automatically think in terms of when we hear the word proof, there are all kinds of standards of proof. And so we talked about the two big ones. There are other ones, actually, depending on administrative law, administrative cases. There's, you have to show substantial evidence. That's really low. Clear and convincing evidence. That's pretty high. It's all over the map. But the point is that lawyers think always about, wh what do I have to show to win? And, and I'll come back to that as we get through the talk. Beyond a reasonable doubt, my graphic of handcuffs. Preponderance of the evidence, think about a, a, uh, an automobile accident negligence case, right? You're using a preponderance of the evidence standard to figure out who wins. There are stages of litigation, and I apologize if the text is small for people, but I'll try to, I'll try to uh, explain it. Litigation doesn't happen all at once. The first step, you, you submit a complaint. You say, such and such happened, OK? And you have a chance that the judge is going to look at your case, and before it ever goes to a jury or a trial, the judge will decide, is this case so patently absurd? Is it so implausible that I'm going to dismiss the case before it ever gets to a jury? That happens all the time. That is called the motion to dismiss stage. So the judge has a chance to dismiss the case. If you win, you get to discovery, and discovery anyone who's practiced law or knows lawyers, that's actually where all the expense is. That's where all of the settlement happens. Discovery is really expensive. Discovery is where you, you interview witnesses, you exchange documents, you download all the emails they sent, you look through them all. It's very time consuming. It's extremely expensive. Most civil cases in this country, 95% of them, are settled in discovery. So discovery is really where all the action is. Despite all the courtroom dramas in the civil world, discovery. Who gets to discovery? And what are the terms and scope of discovery? That's where all the action is. Ultimately, if, if the case continues on, it'll go to trial, and there'll be a verdict either from a, ju uh, a jury or a judge will render his judgment. And then there's appeals. So that, 
there are stages of litigation as we go through, okay? Direct versus circumstantial evidence. That's the third principle I want to talk about. There are two kinds of evidence that you'll have in a, in a trial. There's direct evidence, which is like eyewitness evidence. I saw so-and-so go through that red light. They were negligent for doing that. If, if that comes in as testimony, that's enough right there. You can win your case. You, you've, you've proven it. You, know, you, might have, you might not believe that witness, but that, that evidence, if believed, is sufficient. There's also circumstantial evidence. Most cases are circumstantial cases. It's actually pretty rare, uh, especially in many civil cases, to have uh, a confession uh, or, uh, or, or in criminal cases, to have a confession. Confession would be a direct, direct evidence. Um, cases are won and lost on circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is little pieces of evidence that you put together and you, you get around what happened. But each one of those pieces isn't enough individually. So in my PowerPoint, I'm sorry it's so small, but think about our negligence case, automobile case. Um, if anyone remembers my cousin Vinny, I couldn't help myself. The, the, the tire tracks, Marissa Tomei's testimony. So there are tire tracks, right? The shape of the tire tracks, how thick they were, where, where the braking happened. It, that might tell you something about the accident. Unless it's extremely, uh, you know, oddly instructive, it, it's circumstantial. It, it'll help build the case, but alone, the tire tracks, unlike my cousin Vinny, will probably not be enough to establish the case. So it's circumstantial. So th that's law school in five minutes. I know we seem very far away from the resurrection, but I, I like to start with that framing because it's going to help us as we go through. Um, so I like for this talk to be, it's, it's like a little case in brief. So the claim or, or, or the complaint, if you will, is this question of whether Jesus rose from the dead bodily. Um, I think, not to bury the lead, that I think there's a preponderance of evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Even more strongly, though, what I think is that this, this case deserves discovery. I think in our culture, this case is often dismissed as implausible. It, it, it's inherently uh, unbelievable for some. And, and that's done really not on the basis of evidence. That's done based on a, a sort of philosophical presupposition about miracles. Someone has a view about miracles, and they say, this is, this is absurd. It's not because people are looking at the evidence, going through discovery, as we talked about, which takes time. Uh, which can be confusing. So we're going to move next. If you get past that motion to dismiss stage, you go to discovery. And I want to talk about four salient facts that we would learn in discovery. So again, this, th my number one point, this case deserves discovery. It should not be dismissed. It should be looked at. And I do think there's a preponderance of the evidence that, that Jesus rose from the dead. I think more of the evidence than not. In fact, I think pretty much all the evidence goes towards his resurrection. I think the only thing that goes the other way is if someone had a philosophical objection to the possibility of miracles. But that's not historical evidence. That's, that, that's a philosophical objection. Okay. Um, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, why the resurrection? Why would I talk about the resurrection and, and not many of the doctrines of our faith? Well, Paul tells us that the resurrection it's, we, we know it's the spearhead of the Christian message, right? So we know that as a theological matter, and that's what Paul's saying here. Paul says, if, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain. And he says, we're, we're the most pitiable people of all. If, if we only have this life, uh, if Christ only helps us in this life, we are the most pathetic group of people there is. So he says, it, it's all about the resurrection, right? It's, it's the pinnacle and celebrating Easter that's all fresh in our minds. Um, that's true as a theological matter. It's also historically true. The resurrection was the spearhead of the Christian message. As sublime as Jesus' teaching was, his moral teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, a lot of it actually was not all that original. It, it, a lot of it's from the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, 
it's, it's not the moral teaching that's getting people to get up and out and risking their lives all around the Mediterranean. It's this fact, it's this conviction that this man appeared to them and was risen from the dead. Uh, so that's, that's why if you want to talk about, you know, the core of Christianity is the resurrection, right? Uh, I think this is a really fertile time to talk about the resurrection. These are hard to see, I know, but I'm sure everyone can see that graph in the left that's just kind of going up to the right. That's from the Pew Forum studies, and the lower left has 2007, and the upper right has 2014, and it's the growth of the quote-unquote nuns, N-O-N-E-S, so those who don't, who don't identify as religious or aren't part of any kind of religious organization. Um, uh, and that number just kind of continues going up and to the right, up and to the right, every time they do this. And this is already uh, dated. Uh, they're, they're, you know, it's continuing that, that trend. Um, I think sometimes it, if you are a mass going Catholic, you can actually, uh, y- you might actually be surprised at how little folks know in the culture about, um, about the basic claims of Christianity, if you kind of scratch the surface, I think you'll be surprised to learn, uh, you know, maybe unlike 100 or 200 years ago, where Christianity was such a part of the culture and, and people just kind of uh, breathed it in, it's really not that way anymore. These things are not being passed on. They're not being communicated. Um, and that graph off to the right, that, that goes by generation. So younger millennials at the top, they're, they're the most likely of any group to be unaffiliated with, with any particular religious community. And, and these are people that identify as agnostic or, or atheist or, or nothing. So it's a fertile time. There's a freshness about the message. I think my own opinion is for the first time in maybe like 14, maybe 1,500 or 1,600 years, I, I, I think there's a general um, lack of knowledge about it. It's genuinely fresh to people. Uh, in a way that maybe we haven't seen since the fall of the Roman Empire. Because after that, Christianity kind of takes over the culture. So I think, I think it's a fertile time to be talking about this and talking to your neighbors and, and other people about it. Um, why, why attempt this? You can imagine kind of criticizing the project from two angles, and I've, you know, had interesting conversations about this, and again, sorry, the text is so small. But there, you could criticize the idea of trying to trot out the evidence from a sort of pious or religious perspective. Uh, someone could say, well, you know, isn't faith ultimately a gift? Why are you in a kind of a heavy-handed why, way going to try to prove the facts of the resurrection? That, it just doesn't fit. We, we shouldn't attempt that. Um, and then the, skept- the more skeptical person on the other side of the spectrum might say, you know, this is a waste of time. In- unless you can prove this, to my sort of sensibilities, and maybe the person is thinking a scientific paradigm or a mathematical paradigm, uh, they'd say, well, you can't prove this. And so so why attempt this? And and I think two two answers to that. I think first Peter tells us to have an answer for our faith, or always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope. And it's not that this has to be everyone's, you know, cup of tea. I mean, a lot of things bring people into the church. I I know for me, this evidence is really powerful. It's something that kind of keeps me grounded and and keeps me excited about the faith. Um, And so uh, that is kind of my retort to why bother, right? Because Peter, and and I think the example the apostles say, you know, you should have an answer. You should be uh, ready. You should know why, why that is. Um, secondly, there's an um, Anglican bishop, uh, N.T. Wright, who's a famous historian. He's written books all about the resurrection. He's got one that's 700 pages just on the resurrection. <laughs> it's incredible. But he says uh, that it's not that historical argument alone is going to force anyone to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But he says historical argument, it's, it's very good at clearing away the brush clearing away the undergrowth behind which skepticisms of various sorts have been hiding. And he says, the proposal that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead possesses unrivaled power 
to explain the historical data at the heart of Christianity. Okay? So let's, let's talk about the data. Okay, so I'm going to talk about four main facts that we would learn in discovery in our, in our civil litigation here, in our, in our case. The first fact I want to talk about is that Jesus existed. That's right, Jesus existed, and he was crucified in approximately 30 AD, okay? Um, so all of our scriptures, the Gospels, Paul's letters, could be torched tomorrow, every last copy, we would still have evidence of this from extra-biblical texts. So texts that were not written by Christians don't rely upon uh, Christian testimony. Okay, so I'm going to focus on uh, three writers. There, you could talk about more, but three kind of main writers. So the first is Tacitus. Maybe people have heard of Tacitus. He was kind of the foremost Roman historian of his day. And he lived uh, 56 to 120, so basically in the generation of the apostles. Um, Lucian was a satirist. He lived in what is now Turkey, but he was Greek in culture. And, uh, sorry, it's cut off there, but Flavius Josephus was a Jewish historian. And all of these men write about Jesus in texts that we have today. And they're not trying to convince anyone that Jesus was God. They're just describing it as a matter of secular history, that this man existed, and that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate. So this is Tacitus. So his book, The Annals, which is part of any, you know, any classical curriculum, um, you can pick it up in a Penguin edition in any Barnes & Noble. He says um, that there... What he, the context he's writing in is the fire of Rome in 64 AD, and he's really criticizing Nero. He didn't like Nero very much. He said Nero you know, was kind of a ferocious person. And he's talking about the way in which Nero went after the Christians, and it's really just an aside. He's not trying to kind of tell anyone about Christianity per se, but he says, you know, as long as I'm telling you about the great fire and all the terrible things Nero is doing, I'll just, in a sentence, talk about this guy named Jesus the founder of this group, his name was Christ, and he had been executed in the reign of Tiberius, which is also what Luke says, by the procurator Pontius Pilate. We know when Pilate reigned. We know that Pilate reigned between 26 and 36 AD, and in the last, I think, 30 or 40 years, we actually found an inscription that was inscribed, it's, it's called the Pilate Stone, it was inscribed, it's in Caesarea Maritima, it's, which is now Israel, um, that has Pilate's name on it. Pilate had it inscribed, and it dates from, from that time. We know when Tiberius reigned. Tiberius reigned 14 to 37 AD. So we can situate Jesus in there. And so Tacitus, the kind of king of Roman historians, right, we learn a lot from him. Jesus existed, Jesus was executed by Pontius Pilate. Lucian, it's a little bit more vague, uh, but in another, again, unconnected work, he says, uh, the one who they still worship today, the man in Palestine who was crucified because he, bought, he brought this new form of initiation into the world. And he's writing around 100 AD or so when he writes that. Josephus is a very interesting figure he's the last one I'll talk about in terms of these extra-biblical sources that testify to Jesus. So he says that Jesus won over many Jews and Greeks, and Pilate, and he has other things to say about Pilate, Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading men among us, condemned him to the cross. Okay? So um, Jesus lived, Jesus died by crucifixion in, in and around 30 A.D. We Anyone who tells you that, you know, uh, we don't really know, it's lost in the mists of time, ask them about how we know about the Norman Cox conquests. Ask them about how do we know about Julius Caesar. Uh, because the same inputs for those are the same inputs here. We have secular historians. These are not biased Christians writing. This is a matter of secular history. Okay, so the first fact we went through. The second, 
The earliest Christians sincerely believed that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. They sincerely believed this. They sincerely believed that Jesus appeared to them in bodily form. Okay, again, apologies on the text. Paul. Paul is kind of, we know more about Paul than we do almost about any ancient figure. I think some would say he, he's kind of the person we know the most about from the ancient world. He left us a lot of writing. Um, we know where he was at particular times. So, as far as the sincere belief that Jesus appeared to the early, to the early Christians, um, Paul, in, in the first letter to the Corinthians, which he writes around 55 AD, he says that he handed on to, on to the Corinthians what he had received, and he's referring to what he received when he first visited Peter and James in Jerusalem shortly after his conversion, which we would place in, the, in, in around 35 or 36 AD. Um, so what does this say about belief in the resurrection? Well, he uses this very interesting word when he says that he went to go visit Peter. And by the way, he says that he visited Peter and he stayed with him for 14 days. Um, and, and he gives us, he situates us, he says that that happened about three years after his conversion. So we know roughly when he is visiting Peter in Jerusalem. He uses this very specific Greek word, I'm not a Greek scholar, but um, when he talks about visiting Cephas, or Peter, it's this Greek word, historesi. Um, historio is how I transliterate it, but... Um, it means investigated. I investigated. It, it's, it's a very specific word. It's not like I shot the breeze with Peter. It's like I tried to get his story. So it's a very loaded term that he uses. Uh, and as one scholar has said, you know, you, you imagine Peter has had the most searing experience of his life, right? Meeting the risen Jesus. Paul has just had the same, completely independent of one another. They're coming together for the first time. As one scholar says, we can, we can assume they were talking about more than just the weather. The, that initial conversation, they're, they're going to be sharing um, their experience of Jesus. And then Paul and Peter are going to go spend the rest of their lives preaching to this fact. Um, and so, unless they have a sincere belief in the resurrection, you're in some bizarre hypothetical world where, what, uh, Paul is, is deceiving Peter about the experiences Paul had, and, and vice versa. Peter, Peter's deceiving uh, Paul about what he, what he heard. It, it, the minute you try to actually think about what the alternative would be, it kind of falls apart. It crumbles. James. So in Scripture, Scripture calls him so the, the brother of the Lord. Uh, as, as Catholics, we think of him as a relative. Um, and there's this line in Mark about his family, when Jesus starts preaching, his family is initially skeptical of him. Uh, they, they said he was out of his mind, and they were trying to kind of bring him back home and say, like, stop, you're embarrassing us. And so um, the, the inference is that James is kind of one of this group that is saying, you know, Jesus, please put a sock in it. This is kind of embarrassing for us. James has a sort of arc from being this initially skeptical, right, that his relative could be making these claims, eventually James becomes a pillar, Paul calls him, of the Jerusalem church. And we know from Josephus, actually, that James was stoned, that he was martyred. And we know when it happened. We know that it happened during uh, the, the priesthood of Ananias. He was a, one of the high priests of the Sanhedrin in, in around the 60s AD. So again, sincere belief that Jesus appeared to him because Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to James and we have James's kind of arc of his biography going from what we would say skeptic to martyr. And again, we know that from secular history. We don't know that. It's not scripture that we're relying on. It's Josephus. Um, quickly, um, there's a whole generation after the initial generation called the Apostolic Fathers. So after Paul and Peter and others die, 
This is a group I knew nothing about until very recently. Sorry, the text is so small, but they are people like Pol Polycarp. <laughs> if I, was that the most popular name on uh, you know, Time Magazine last year? Polycarp. Polycarp, Papias of Heriopolis, try to say that 10 times fast. Ignatius of Antioch, maybe some, some of you have heard of them. Um, what's interesting about these figures is they knew the apostles, and so Papias knew John. Polycarp knew John, the apostle. Papias actually tells us who knew whom and who wrote down whose accounts. So Papias tells us that um, Mark was the companion of Peter and wrote down Peter's accounts. So we don't have just like anonymous gospels running around. Papias actually tells us how that transmission worked. Ignatius writes very firmly about the bodily resurrection. And so these, these early generations of Christians, right from the get-go, are firm on the bodily resurrection and the appearances of Jesus. So it's not the case that that's some sort of later addition. It's, it's consistent through those early generations. Okay. Third, um, the tomb was empty. The empty tomb. So how would we possibly get to a point where we would think it's probable or it's more likely than not that the tomb was empty. So, this is an interesting one. So, this, this picture, if you can see it, it's actually the, the women discovering the tomb, and it's just sort of a, a hint of the stone being rolled away in the back, if you can see that. Um, there's a principle of interpretation in history and literature. It's called the principle of embarrassment. And the concept is, is that if someone includes an embarrassing detail, that often, more likely than not, it's, it's, it's true. So if someone's putting a narrative together and there's a detail in there that's just embarrassing, there's no reason to include it, there's often an inference that that, that has a higher level of reliability. Okay, how does that relate to the empty tomb? All four Gospels are unanimous about who, was, who were the first people to discover the tomb. They were all women who were the first ones to discover the empty tomb. If you were trying to concoct an early religious movement in the ancient Near East, this would be an absolutely insane way to do it. Why? Well, and thank goodness we've moved on from this, Women had low social status in the ancient Near East. Their testimony was not accepted in courts of law. So the idea that you would pin the most important claim on, and consistent, they're consistent about this, uh, on a group of women, and in fact, Scripture even says that, that the apostles thought the women, right, it, the misogyny is actually there. So it's like, they thought the women were out of their mind, right? Um, so the fact that we've got this account that's unanimous on that score. Scholars look at that and say, that makes it seem more reliable. Secondly, um, there's this throwaway line in the Gospel of Matthew where um, Matthew says that the high priests paid people to spread a rumor that Jesus' body was stolen. And it's, it's just really a throwaway line. It, it doesn't really connect to much else. Well, what's interesting about that? Well, it, it presupposes an empty tomb, okay? So Matthew, think about this. He's including in a book where he's telling you about Jesus and he wants you to, you know, be persuaded of the truth of this, this rumor that's going around. Why, why would you include a rumor gratuitously unless it were circulating? Okay? The rumor, by the way, if you kind of meditate on that for a second, if, if in fact that rumor is circulating, um, the fact that the rumor is that the body was stolen, right, um, it suggests that the tomb was empty, because if there were any other way to defeat the early Christian message, it would have been very easy to 
show the body, or even argue that the grave had been moved, if you could somehow point to it, okay? But that, that doesn't, the historical record shows that that's not the tack that was taken. The tack that was taken from the early days was uh, the rumor that the, the body was stolen. Thirdly, the Jerusalem factor. So the preaching about the empty tomb, it's not happening in some far-flung area of Saudi Arabia. It's not happening in Egypt, you know, on the periphery. The message begins to be preached in Jerusalem. So again, if you were opposed to the message, and we know that there was a lot of opposition to the message, the easiest thing to do would be to point to the tomb, right? point to even a putative body, um, convince people that that's the body, even though, you know, maybe you don't know whether it is. But there's, there's no suggestion that anyone ever even tried to produce the body. And so that's led many, many scholars to say um, that the tomb was more likely than not empty. As one scholar put it, all the strictly historical evidence we have is in favor of the empty tomb. And those scholars who reject it ought to recognize that they do so on some other ground other than history. Okay, last fact. The key sources, they are relatively early. They're relatively early, okay? And we'll talk about what that, what does that mean to say early, okay? Because it takes some adjusting um, when you're talking about the ancient world. So, just this sort of thematic point. I think there's a kind of a, 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 a fuzzy way in which we think about how we know things in the past. And it feels like the farther away we get from something, right, the less we know, uh, the more misty that, that gets. We see that in our personal lives all the time, right? Unless you take notes of that phone call, like a week later you don't remember it, right? So that's the general trend. In this area, and that, that might have been true for many, many years. But thanks to the uh, incredible work of scholars and scientists over the last 50, 100 years, we know more now than we did then. Okay? So I want to talk about some really interesting happenings in, in scholarship that were not possible 1,000 or 500 years ago that we now know. And so the, it's not the case that the evidence is kind of, in, in, in uh, legal cases, we talk about spoilation of evidence, you worry about witnesses dying, witnesses moving away, documents being destroyed. At this point, the reverse is happening. We're learning more about the context than we ever knew before, okay? Um, so what am I talking about here? Um, I'll refer to this. I talked a minute ago about Paul. One big find of the last really 50 or 60 years um, is that there's oral tradition inside of the scriptures. So in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and if you pick out, if you take out your Bibles, you'll often see this kind of text that's sometimes like set off or italicized. That's the editors saying that, in their opinion, that that little section or stanza, it's 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 oral tradition, or it's a song. And so scholars have, and, and across sort of lines of believers and unbelievers, um, scripture scholars have come to the determination that there's oral tradition within scripture. Well, why does that matter? Well, the, the, the key example of this, and apologies if we can't see, but um, this is a timeline. First bullet is the crucifixion of Jesus, then Paul's conversion, uh, Paul's visit to Jerusalem, another visit. Ultimately, he writes his first letter, letter to the Corinthians in 55 AD. So if you put Jesus' crucifixion around 30, and Paul's writing around 55 AD, and all s scholars agree that the letter to the Corinthians, there's some debate about some of Paul's letters, whether they are actually Paul's. Corinthians is not one of them. Corinthians is universally viewed as being one of Paul's authentic letters. So even a skeptical scholar, uh, theologically, would say that's one of Paul's authentic letters. He writes there, and 
you probably all remember this line from 1 Corinthians 15, but he says, you know, I, I handed on to you what was of first importance, that Jesus uh, died, and on the third day he rose again. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the twelve. He appeared to 500 at once. And then last of all, he appeared to me. That little section where he says died, buried, rose, scholars now think, and this is recent, that that is oral tradition. Why is that important? Well, remember I said that Paul goes to Jerusalem? Scholars, many scholars say, that's when he received that oral tradition. And so Paul's letter in 55 with the crucifixion in 30, that's already pretty tight as far as the ancient world goes. If you want to talk about um, Alexander the Great or Buddha, the the texts that talk about their lives, hundreds of years later, hundreds. In Paul's case, his, his letter to the Corinthians, and he has earlier ones like Thessalonians, are about 20 years after Jesus' death. But the big finding has been that wait a minute, if you trace this oral tradition, which he says he received from the other apostles, you're placing that, it moves back that time. So that source is even earlier than that. And so I find it convincing to say that that's probably from the 30s or 40s. Some go so far as to say that first trip to Jerusalem. That, that seems logical. Um, so, you're, so all of a sudden you're talking about five or ten years after Jesus' resurrection, that that oral tradition comes from. Um, okay, so that's, that's the dating of that oral tradition. That, that's a recent discovery. So when, you know, Enlightenment philosophers like Voltaire are writing and criticizing Christianity, that's not available. No one knew that. This is new. Another area of research that's going on is the dating of the Gospels and the dating of the book of Acts. So I even remember, I remember sitting in CCD and and high school theology and and then later teaching some of this, but there was a very, like, there's, and and it may still be in textbooks, but there was this real, like, orthodoxy around the dating of of, uh, the Gospels. And it kind of went like this, and I apologize if you can't quite see it, but The idea was Mark is the earliest, and Mark is around 70 AD. So, right, again, back to our timeline, about 40 years after Jesus dies, right? All of a sudden, that feels like a larger span. And then Matthew and Luke were years after that, because the idea was that Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark. And then John, most people thought, because of that high theology where it's so theological, people thought it's even later. Okay, and so people would say, you know, the earliest is Mark, and then John is in the 90s or 100s, maybe even later than that. And it was taught in a very kind of like certain way. Like, this is just gospel, pardon the pun. Um, Well, people are really starting to pick away at that and say, "Uh, I'm not so sure. And there's one, I'll just pick kind of one example why I find this so interesting. So one kind of thread that one prominent scholar has been pulling on, but there are renowned German scholars who are of this mind. They look at the book of Acts. Now, Acts is a sequel, actually, to the Gospel of Luke, because Luke refers to his Gospel when he's he's in Acts. Um, If you can date Acts, then you know that Luke must be before it. Acts is super interesting. Um, Acts, as we know, covers all of these accomplishments and, uh, you know, things that the apostles did, right? It has where Paul traveled, who he spoke to, you know, Paul blew his nose last Wednesday, okay? I mean, it really goes into some detail. Um, One thing that's conspicuously absent from the end of Acts is Paul's death or Peter's death. We learn that Stephen died and that he was stoned. Is Stephen mentioned otherwise? Do we know anything else Stephen did? No. But Peter and Paul, their deaths, not mentioned. Wow, that is a really like interesting rhetorical effect if you're just 
not mentioning the, some of the most important details of these two giants, right? So uh, this has caused one scholar, his name is Brant Petrie, to say, this must be written before they die, because how could you not include that? And so it ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome in 62, give or take, 62 AD. And the, the kind of unanimous tradition is that Paul uh, died in, in the mid to late 60s under Nero's persecution. Well, if you think to yourself, well, I'm convinced that Acts must have been written before Paul's death, then you're putting Acts in the early 60s. Okay, remember, Acts is a sequel, so it had to come after Luke. So that pushes Luke back to maybe somewhere in the early 60s, early 50s. Luke, we think, borrowed from Mark and maybe this other hypothetical source, Q, they, they call it. So that puts uh, uh, Mark even further back than that. Okay, so all of a sudden, it's compressing that, that time period. When you look at Paul's letters, when you look at when, you know, at the very least, it's, up, it's more up for grabs than it was, but I, I, I find this convincing. So that period is compressed. So you don't have this long period of time where no one knows how these things are being transmitted. As far as the ancient world goes, it's pretty tight. And if you don't believe me, think about how fast it was since, you know, college reunion or, <laughs> right, like your last big wedding anniversary. And those years go fast. Like, I, I cannot believe how fast it's been since uh, senior year of college. It's, it's frightening. Um, so that's, that's some of the new work. Uh, okay. So we've gone through discovery. We learned our four facts, just to back up. Jesus existed, the sincere belief in the appearances, uh, the tomb was empty, and the key sources are earlier, and much earlier than people thought for a long time. Okay, so if that's discovery, and now we've presented the evidence at trial, okay. Has anyone served on a jury? Yeah? Do you remember, it was probably one of the most boring parts of what was maybe already a boring experience, but uh, the, the judge had some instructions for you. Remember that? And sometimes the judges are not the most, you know, they literally just read off this, you know, in a monotone as you're sitting there for, it might be an hour. They're giving you the instructions on the law about how you are to decide the case. So there is an instruction that is read uh, in courthouses across the country, it's common. It's part of this, like, one book that almost all federal judges use. And it says, uh, there's an instruction about circumstantial evidence. And it says, some evidence is direct, some evidence is circumstantial. Let's talk through this example so you know what circumstantial evidence is. They say, picture that you're in a, you're in a courtroom, the blinds are drawn, and in comes a man with an umbrella and he's wearing a trench coat, and there's little drops of water on his shoulder, some on his shoe. Then the judge says, that's circumstantial evidence of it's raining outside, right? Do we have metaphysical certitude that it's raining outside? No, no, right? But the, the judge is actually saying, this is a situation which you are not only allowed to, but you, sh you really should make the inference that it's raining outside based on this evidence. Are there alternative possibilities for how he ended up with those objects and how they ended up wet? Does anyone want to take a stab? What's an alternative way? Your imagination can just kind of run. Sprinkler, sprinkler, good, yeah. A million, you can imagine a million things, right? He could have gone in the bathroom and, uh, you know, got a little excited before his hearing and the water just sprayed all over himself. Um, he might have on purpose poured Poland Spring on himself. There are all kinds of things you can imagine. Are they probable? No. Uh, absent some other fact, like this, he's very unstable or he's afraid of water or something. But they're not probable. How does this relate? There are alternative theories about the resurrection. 
People have been writing about it really from the Enlightenment on. In my view, all of them are far less probable than the Gospel account. And so we're going to talk about really the, the, the alternative theories, and we're going to try to address each one of them to close. So I, again, apologize this is so close, and it, it, it makes it look much more complicated than it is. But if you go all the way to the right, those are basically the five possibilities. Okay? So um, either Jesus died or he didn't. If he died and he rose, then we're here, right? That's Christianity. That's what it looks like. If he didn't rise, there are three possibilities. The apostles were deceived themselves in their senses. The appearances that they thought they saw were not real, right? That puts you in the hallucination theory of the resurrection, okay? If Jesus didn't rise, what else could it be? Well, it could be that the apostles created uh, myths. They created kind of this legendary material. Um, they didn't necessarily intend it to be taken at face value. They just wanted to kind of create an uplifting, maybe, maybe kind of literarily true, but not historically true piece of writing. So that would be the theory that the accounts are myth or legend, okay? Um, um, Finally, it might have been a conspiracy, right? Um, and, and so, did the apostles purposely deceive everyone around them? Um, lastly, Jesus, right, he either died or he didn't die. If he didn't die, then this has been titled the swoon theory, that he did not die on the cross, okay? So, there are issues with all of these alternative theories. Um, I'll take kind of the swoon theory first, that Jesus didn't die. There's a really interesting um, Journal of American Medicine article from 1986 on this, and it, it kind of goes through in painstaking detail the, uh, what Jesus would have experienced, and uh, basically says th there is no real way that someone would survive all of those things that he encountered. Um, the swoon theory has really fallen out of favor. Um, it was, I think, more popular in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, but most reputable scholars do not subscribe. You know, they might attack the resurrection from a variety of ways, but you don't really hear it very often that uh, someone says, well, Jesus didn't die. Um, he only apparently died. Um, so, and again, you don't need a JAMA article to know that even if he did survive the resurrection, if he, even if he did survive the, the crucifixion, right, how inspiring would that have been, right? Someone kind of within an inch of his life trying to um, convince someone to, convince the world to, to follow him. Um, you know, I'd probably say, like, let's get you, you know, a medic. Let's, let's get you taken care of. I, I don't know that you're, uh, you know, the Messiah, so the swoon theory has really been kind of put aside. Um, the hallucination theory, the idea that the uh, apostles were um, maybe through wishful thinking um, having these visions that weren't apparent or they were kind of seeing ghosts. Now, the issue there is that the experience of, it's one thing if someone has a hallucination or a vision, but the kind of constellation of appearances that the, the early Christians are having um, in groups, um, multiple people individually having the same vision of the risen Jesus, uh, it's, it's a, as I understand it, it's a phenomenon just unknown in psychology and, and um, psychiatry. It's not to, to say it's impossible, nothing's impossible, but it's just not known, and so you end up kind of trading miracle stories, right? You're, you're kind of saying, oh, well, I don't think, I don't think it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the risen Jesus. I think it was hallucination. Well, it, it would probably be the, f you know, it's really the first time in recorded history that anything like that has ever happened. Um, 
the, the more popular, kind of where the payoff is these days, is the idea that um, it's, it's myth, legend, or, or folklore. And so the, the apostles created myths. It, it, it's not so much that individual apostles sat down and, and wanted to write like untrue stories, because that would put you in the conspiracy box. It's that this game of telephone happened over a period of years, and, and you know, the early apostles thought something different than the later apostles, and the, the message just got garbled, if anyone remembers the game of telephone from growing up, right? By the time you get around the circle, it's some completely different message. Bart Ehrman is a famous scholar in this area, and, and that's essentially his thesis. He says, it, it, it was a game of telephone, and so what you end up getting in uh, the year 70 or 80 or 90 is just, it's just different. It's just unreliable. It's not what Paul and others would have experienced. Um, for all the reasons we talked about, um, that gap is not that long, actually. And people who study legend, people who study myth, would tell you that that is, it's too short a time. Legend doesn't grow up that fast. Legend grows up over many, many, many decades, centuries in many cases. Um, these, are not, these are not legends. These are uh, narrative accounts that we can, we can date to particular times. So um, finally, um, in, in, in a court of law, you'd say, you know, if, if you dispose of all of the alternative theories, then you've made yourself, uh, you, you've reached that preponderance standard. And so, so my, my sort of case and my pitch to the jury is that the, the actual claim, the Easter claim, is uh, rational, it's, it's evidence-based, um, and it's uh, more likely than all the others. Uh, and I, something happened. Something happened. And the question is, what happened? And it's a puzzle for all humanity to deal with. Uh, something happened that time, that, that, that day, that Easter day. And... Uh, there are a variety of approaches to it. I think the Easter message is, is the most probable. Uh, and most of all, I think uh, it deserves discovery and it needs to be looked at. So thank you so much for your time. I know I probably ran very long, uh, but I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, attention this whole time. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, on behalf of everyone and everyone who's watching from home as well. And I just thought we could take maybe one or two questions if anyone had something that you wanted to maybe ask for a clarification on. Any show of hands? Please. Yeah. Where? We got one? Go ahead. Dave. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chris. Great presentation. You know, it's, it's interesting talking about the, the resurrection. You know, having been blessed a Catholic, one of the most incredible things that I've been blessed to have seen was in Turin, Italy. When I worked for the Italian company, I drove from Milan to Turin, and I saw in the Jubilee year 2000 the Shroud of Turin, the Sindine de Turino. And I'll tell you what, it was, it was incredible, I mean, to see the burial cloth of our Lord. And, you know, you listen to uh, Mary Magdalene when she looked in the tomb, and she saw not a body but a burial cloth. And I thought to myself, my God, I've been blessed to have seen the Shroud of Turin. So, and you can look at the markings of, you know, where the crown of thorns were, where the, uh, the five wounds were. It was just incredible, just another testament that, you know, faith is alive and well. No, thanks, absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, the Shroud, you could give, and people do give whole talks just on the Shroud. Um, and, uh, there, there's one right here. There's one right here okay. who's done that. Do you? So there you okay. go. I need, you to, do, I need, do to, do I need to get looped in here. <laughs> yeah, no, it is something very, very powerful. But thank you, Dave, for sharing that. Gene? In, in terms of the writing evidence, what are the earliest samples that still exist? Because I presume parchment would be gone, and there are copies of things that have been made over the years. Yeah, I think... Um, I think the earliest New Testament fragment we have is from like the early 120s. It's like a fragment of John. And I actually, I actually think it's 
the, the beginning of John. Um, in terms of, uh, and, and I will not have it all ready here, but um, I think as far as like full um, gospels all together, I remember seeing in the British Museum, I think there's, there's one called the Codex, they called them Codices, but the Codex, Codex Sinaiticus, it was at Sinai. Um, I think that's more like the, the 300s in terms of having a whole, um, the whole arrangement. Um, but the earliest, I think the earliest fragment I know of is the, the 120, something like that. Um, and then there are various fragments from that. Um, I think one of the interesting things, again, that people have only gotten to know in the last few hundred years, um, sorry, probably the last century, is just how stable um, the transmission was. And so there are, there are scribal errors here and there, but um, just kind of at a high level, when you look at you know, those early codices from the third century, fourth century, through the medieval times, through to today, the, the scriptures are remarkably stable. Remarkably stable. Perfect, yeah. And I have to say, too, uh, at the Vatican, um, in the, underneath the library where the secret archives are, I actually had the privilege of taking a rabbi from here in Bergen County down there with my Hebrew professor. And I remember we, there, there all these uh, scrolls were actually there. And I got to hold in my hands in a plate um, the last paragraph of St. Peter's first letter and the first paragraph of his second letter. And there was like so much security, so much, you know, uh, difficulty getting there. I had asked for the appointment well in advance. They had to search us. And the sad thing was, I was asking, why is there so much security? And they said, sadly, it's because many scholars over the years would come into the Vatican Library with a little exacto knife and you know cut out something and take it home with them and everything. So, uh, but it was fascinating there. And I remember both the rabbi and my professor were going back and forth there, looking at these scrolls, and it's amazing. But they do go back very far. I thought Jean's question was more about the extra biblical thing. Or are you asking about the bib? Oh, the, okay, yeah. And that, then you did give the answer. I, I thought it done things. And then we'll just take the last question over here from Jerry. Hi, it was really, really fascinating, uh, especially the uh, timeline of Paul's conversion after the crucifixion. Just from a personal standpoint, I marvel at the way that you uh, integrated your professional life with your spiritual life. Could you share with us a little bit what made you bring those two things together? Because it's really interesting to see a legal explanation of the resurrection. Sure. Um, that's a hard one. <laughs> no, thank you for asking. Um, no, I think, uh, I mean, I've been thinking about these questions a long time. It kind of, they're just always running in the, like, CPUs in the background. <laughs> um, and I think, I think, teaching at, I had, I taught high school theology for two years, and trying to make the case to, you know, 14 and 15 year old prepubescent boys of why they should care, uh, you know, why they should spend their time, why, why theology isn't just a total joke subject to, wait, you know, you have to kind of get your gears turning, um, and then, you know, I, I guess one, there's one particular person, there's a, uh, like, 100 years ago, there was a Harvard Law School professor who basically tried to do exactly this. And he was an evidence guru. His name is Simon Greenleaf. Um, and he was one of, like, the early Harvard Law School professors. But he, he wrote a book. It's called um, The Gospels According to the Rules of Evidence. And, and that, he, he was kind of my more specific inspiration. Um, um, and so, yeah. That, that was one path along the way. The, the Case for Christ, if anyone's read that book, um, which became a movie, seeing that movie really got me inspired. Um, so I think that's, those are points along the way, I guess. Thank you.
Thanks for and coming. again, Christian, thank you very much. And I thought since we are in the presence of our Lord, could you just lead us in a closing prayer? Maybe we could all stand and uh, you lead us in a prayer, if you okay. would. All right. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Um, dear Lord, thanks so much for being here with us tonight. We know where two or three are gathered in your name. You're in the, in the midst of us. Um, help us to come to know you better uh, through history, through our relationships, through the sacraments, and uh, make, us, make us all saints. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you again very, very much. And I think we also have to applaud Christian's two boys. They were so well behaved. So very good boys. Very, very good. Very proud of you.